There was once a minstrel, a happy-go-lucky fellow, wandering the country to sing at the courts of lords and kings. Everywhere he was welcomed with open arms. Strumming his lute and spinning his tales of romance and daring do, he'd charm the ladies and then move on. Oh, what a life. Yes, nice life. Except, of course, it wasn't like that at all. Showbiz was just as fickle in the Middle Ages as it is today. The tastes of audiences just as likely to change. And then, as now, behind the entertainment, there was often a political agenda. In fact, being a minstrel or a court poet was often downright dangerous. Especially when performing in front of a hostile audience, or even worse, a hostile army, as in the case of the Norman minstrel, Typhair. Oh, Typhair is my name, and singing is my game. And if you want to know what a minstrel's for, here's how I got to start a war. It's the story of one of the greatest acts of bravado of all time. Well, one of the daftest acts of bravado, if you ask me. And it took place in that field over there, 1066, at the Battle of Hastings. King Harold and his 7,000 English troops are packed behind their shield wall up on that ridge there, where Battle Abbey now stands. Duke William and his Normans are lined up in equal numbers further down the slope over there. It looks like the English have got the advantage. And for a moment, it seems as if the Normans have got last minute nerves. Nobody wants to be the first to charge. But then suddenly a figure rides out of the Norman lines. But it's not Duke William. It's not even a soldier. It's the minstrel Typhair. And he starts riding straight to the English lines, performing a juggling act with his sword and lance. Well, the English stand there, enjoying the show, until Typhair gets to the point where he hurls his spear at one of the English soldiers and kills him. And then all hell breaks loose. The French charge and the rest is extremely well-known history. Considering how well known the story of the Battle of Hastings is, it's surprising that Typhair never seems to figure in it, not even in the Bayer Tapestry. In fact, if it wasn't for one of the chronicles, we'd have never heard of Typhair's bravery. Then I suppose the Norman knights, whom the Bayer Tapestry was supposed to be celebrating, wouldn't want to be shown up by a mere minstrel. But then, what was a minstrel doing on the battlefield in the first place? <laughs> Well, there was a lot more to being a minstrel than just playing music. The word minstrel actually means little servant, and they were low down the social order. And in that rough and ready military culture of the 11th century, little distinction was made between those servants who could cook or do other chores and those who could write poetry or play musical instruments. These were not particularly sophisticated courts. The warlords who ran them placed little value on fancy stuff like the arts and entertainments. Their main interests evolved around the subtleties of fighting and killing each other. So minstrels counted as little more than menials in the household, and the more talents they had, the better. One 13th century poem defines a true minstrel as one who can speak and rhyme well, be witty, know the story of Troy, balance apples on the point of knives, juggle, jump through hoops, play the sitole, mandora, harp, fiddle and psaltery. He's further advised, for good measure, to learn the arts of imitating birds, putting performing asses and dogs through their paces and, of course, of operating marionettes. It seems it was also an advantage if you were good at break dancing. Nothing's new. These little servants, these minstrels, would be expected to perform lots of different roles. For example, they might be asked to act as night watchmen so they could sound the alarm in case of fire or attack. In fact, in 1306, 
A minstrel by the name of Richard raised the alarm at Windsor and prevented the castle from being burnt down. Pity there weren't a few minstrels around in 1992. <laughs> Servants who could blow a trumpet would also have been vital amidst the cacophony of battle to rally the troops or cheer them on. Away from the battlefield, these same servants provided the entertainment, though with rather a restricted repertoire. You see, the warriors and warlords of the 11th century weren't particularly interested in stories of teenage love or stories about how someone who, despite appalling handicaps, manages to become a concert pianist. What they wanted was stories about men like themselves killing other men, like the ones they killed that morning. Uh, preferably with lots of gory details and swaggering about. These were called chansons de geste, or songs of great deeds. The chanson on every minstrel's lips was this, the Song of Roland, a 4,000 line epic and the Norman number one for nearly a century. <laughs> so that's kind of the uh, Norman top of the pops, is it? Well, it's a sort of big ballad that you'd have heard in the early 12th century. It would have been very popular. It's the most popular of the chansons de geste. I mean, any love element there? No, it's, a, it's an environment where love had very little uh, place. <laughs> it's a kind of boys culture. Isn't it? Yeah, I think it's been referred to as uh, the sort of buddy movie mentality <laughs> where the lads get together, they do what they have to do and if there's any women there, they're very peripheral. The only romance in the Song of Roland is when the hero Charlemagne declares his undying love and loyalty to his sword. It's a lovely song, and there's another 3,554 lines to go. They certainly knew how to get value out of their minstrels. So why do they stick minstrels up in the galleries like that? Well, there are two reasons for it, really. There was obviously um, an acoustical reason for it. Uh, the sound would carry better. But there was also another reason. In the court, you invite musicians in who are of a lower caste. You don't really want them to be hobnobbing with you, so you keep them away. So it's a sort of hierarchical and a spatial right, you removal keep, you keep of them the in lower the caste. Like that, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Presumably they could also sort of, they were observing what's going on, I guess. Was... Yes. What they forgot was that musicians have ears as well as fingers, and whilst they're playing, they can hear conversations that were going on. And it's no surprise that musicians often found themselves in, in a sort of secondary employment in the field of espionage. As well as acting as spies, minstrels were also expected to act as propagandists, supposedly recording the deeds of battle and then producing a sort of end-of-the-match report. And of course, they'd better make damn sure whoever's paying them is chosen as man of the match. Medieval minstrels were the PR men of their day. They'd embark on well-planned tours, reciting their poems to publicize the latest achievements of their bosses. Simon the Montford is mighty and strong. He loves to do right and he hates to do wrong. Of course, the minstrels didn't let the truth stand in the way of a good story any more than the spin doctors of today do. And take this account. It's by a, a herald come minstrel in the entourage of the Black Prince. And it tells how the prince wiped the floor with the entire Spanish navy. The battle was fierce, the battle was grim, but God let fortune smile on him. And through his courage, skill and might, the Spaniards all were killed outright. 